to reiterate, uh, in the case of curves, we see that the minimal extension is a constructible sheet. And so you could say, I still haven't seen why perverse sheaves are better than constructible sheaves. But we've seen these extremely natural subends coming from maps, and the fact that they are simple is extremely powerful. So in general, one should think that the, I mean, it's just a fact that the drive category, I mean, the, the abelian category of perverse sheaves on a, on a space is extremely complicated. You know, it's something like, in a, in a very simple example of the flag variety, it's equivalent to category O, for a complex semi-simple which is a very subtle, subtle category. Um, and so the fact that these things coming from direct images are semi-simple is an extremely non-trivial fact. Okay, so now I just I want to explain kind of the theory that I just did for general spaces, so general case. And basically, it just goes the same way as the curves, and so okay. I won't give each of these out. So we have x, and we fix it with this gratification. X is a projective one, I feel, it's just thing. J lower shriek and J lower star preserved for those sheets. And this is not true in general. So exercise. Um, if you take C2 without the origin, then you put in C2. Then J lower star of the constant. So if you imagine what happens here when you take this direct limit, you're taking the col basically what you're doing is calculating the cohomology of C2 without zero, which is homotopic to a three sphere, which has cohomology groups in degree minus two and one. And that one is forbidden. So that's the first exercise. Um, but the remark is that J lower star preserves the verse sheets. This is just a remark for experts. Which is different to power. And I probably won't have time in this, in this course to explain. So it looks the whole time like we're doing purely topological things. But then uh, extre an extremely important role is played, for example, by affine morphisms. And the reason is basically because, uh, uh, for example, affine spaces have, um, have the homotopy type of something half dimensional. And so you have lots of cohomology vanishing for affine morphisms you don't have anymore. And that's also explained why this was OK for curves, because the inclusion of a curve minus any number of points is always affine. Uh, so, that's the first point. And the second point is an exercise, which is that if you have um, J the inclusion of U into X and Z the complement, open and closed, 
So these don't preserve perverse sheaves. Wow, I've never noticed how close perverse, preserve, and perverse are. <laughs> um, so J lower star of P B uh P to the to zero U is contained in P B. Kind of ignore this So this says that even though J lower star and J lower shriek are no, no longer perverse perverse sheaves, preserved perverse sheaves, they uh, preserve uh, half of the teeth structure. So they're, they're the, the left right teeth. But I kind of want to skim over this. Um, and then we define PJ lower star to be the zero first cohomology of J lower star. And this is a function from M promotion of U promotion of X. And similarly, BJ lower shrink And also we've got the I up star. And so in the notes, um, I do this in more detail. And so if you're if you feel motivated, it's worth going through the notes. It's a few pages on kind of left T's axis, right T's axis. So we have a junction. Basically, we take the junctions that we've seen in the gluing situation and then just write T's everywhere. So, um, Shriek has no 
motion supported on Z, PJ lower star has no subobject supported on Z, so the intermediate extension has no subobject or quotient supported on Z, etc. Um, and so, as before, so the consequence is that PJ lower shrinking um, F is simple. And a warning that I wanted to say, so this is on the exercises, but this functor is uh, very predictable when applied to simple <coughs> sheets. It's extremely unpredictable when you apply it to general sheets. So a warning is that J tree star preserves Injections, surjections, but is not exactly the other. So it says that it's simple, whatever F is not F is. Yeah, if, 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 if you apply it to a simple object, it's no problem, you know kind of exactly what you get. But if you apply it to an extension, you can get things in between in very subtle ways. And this is really quite good. Yeah. I mean, I've already told this story once in, this, in these lectures in Bond, but I kind of found it amazing. On Math Overflow, there was this question of, can you find a functor that does, like, can you find a functor that essentially has these properties. And someone had this very bizarre setting of quivers, and then I was looking at it and I realized it's just it's just this one for perverse sheets. And so this is a kind of canonical example of a pretty bizarre functor. Yes. 
where L is simple. Do you mean this in mx lambda or in mx? In mx. Ah, the simple proposition is in mx lambda, exactly. Uh -huh. Precisely, yeah. And just as before, if now we forget the stratification, basically the simple proposition are just given by a locally closed, smooth, connected subset, sub variety, with a local system on it, where we need to mod out an equivalence relation that two local systems are equivalent if they become isomorphic upon restriction to, a, to an open dead subset inside the two sub But one doesn't need to. But we'll be focusing on it. If, if you understand the stratified case, it's very easy to understand the general. So, George, is the simple perverse shifts in MX lambda, do they remain simple in, in MX? Yeah. So it's really a full, it's really a full abelian subcategory. So any subobject in MX, in MX would be a subobject in MX lambda. Okay. So now that's, that's great, but the big mystery is this. So if you think about what you need to do to calculate this image, you need to take the code of this map, and then you need to calculate the two perverse cohomology groups of this, of this code, and put them here and here, and then calculate either the code kernel of this map or the kernel of this map. And this is disastrous because it's really extremely difficult to, con to calculate the perverse, the, the perverse um, filtration of an object in an arbitrary construction. So this is a very nice kind of formalism that tells us how many simple objects there are, but to actually do any calculations this is a disaster. So now I want to explain uh, the Deline construction, which gives you one way of calculating stalks, but it's also extremely difficult to actually carry out in practice but it's the, it's the only thing that you have in complete generality. And then I'll explain, hopefully, the decomposition theorem, or at least state it, and this gives you a, uh, an actually very effective way of calculating the source. But it's an effective way that relies on a very deep theorem. So, the main construction. So this is what Deline wrote down on a napkin at a party at IHES and gave to McPherson, and then McPherson spent a few months staring at it. So is this theorem difficult to Which is the sense of this, this theorem? No, no, no. This is easy. It's a, this is just the same as, same as the curves. Mm -hmm. These guys are simple. This is, The difficult thing is to say something about these objects. So, um, suppose that B is a complex dimension of X, and we want to consider the following filtration XB contains XB minus 1. So this should be the open strata, open d-dimensional strata, x d minus 2. Uh, 
zero to the last. And now we fix L in local systems on A of X lambda, where the dimension of um, X lambda is N, and let I denote the inclusion of X lambda into X lambda. So here's our x, x2 would be all of the open strata, x1 would be maybe this is extremely confusing message. Sorry. Because these are open, it's probably not better than what we need. Let's say that this is a surface, we start off with U2, which is an open subset, and then we add things of dimension 1, so we add curves, and so U1 is just X without a certain number of points, and then U0 is everything. And basically what the Deline construction will tell us how to do is to take, a, take something on the open part and extend it dimension by dimension over the going deeper and deeper into the co-dimension. Can you remind what is U lambda? Ah, I, I changed the word. U lambda, X lambda could be U lambda. Okay. Is there any more mistakes? I think there's, I saw them down to that. Yeah. In the same line, I think everywhere where it's U lambda should be X lambda. X lambda. Ah. So we've just seen the principle that it's an extremely good idea to change notation in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> says, so here, I see x lambda bar L is isomorphic to the following thing. So firstly, we extend our local system to everything where it's kind of obvious. So everything that's our, our local system is supported on, on, on some s smooth, so in that example, it might be supported on a curve, and then we extend it by zero to everything bigger. So this is the, this is the obvious, obvious part. You know, a perverse sheep on a closed sub-variety, and a closed smooth sub-variety is just the local system. And that's, what we're doing there, and we're putting it in the right degree. And now we do the following thing. <coughs> so, I want to call these inclusions JD down to K1. 
So we, we basically progressively we include across one strata, so we take direct image across one strata, and then we truncate less than m. And then we do m minus 1. Okay. And at the end of the day, we arrive at power less than zero, power less than zero basically. For example, if L is a local system on U inside X, so this is open inside X is here curve, what does the lean construction tell us? It tells us that I see U bar, which is just X. L is how less than equal to zero of J lower star of the local system in V1. And this is precisely what we calculated before the break, namely that the IC of the J shoot star extension of the local system takes the invariance in degree minus one and chops off and doesn't take the invariant the co -invariant. <coughs> and also this kind of tells us what we have to do when we calculate an intersection homology complex. And also what is tau? Ah, sorry, this is the truncation. And this should be minus n. This is truncation with respect to um, standard view. So tau zero, what takes you zero? Oh, this should be J one. So I always have M. Ah, there's no J0, right, okay. Thank you. One. Oh no, Okay. Now I think it's 
Sorry? Yes. But as you can see, it's kind of, you know, I, I don't usually use the delimiter. Right? And could you say the good is truncation of this function? So, so tau strictly less than zero of a complex in an abelian category will be the complex that has c minus two, c minus one, and then at zero we'll have the kernel of b. So um, it has the property, the reason, the notation is because hi of tau less than or equal to zero of c is hi and c of i is less than or equal to zero is zero. So it keeps the cohomology the same up to a given degree and then Maybe, do you mind if I go four minutes over or something? Four or five. I just want to do one example of this Killeen construction to show you an example where the IC shift is not concentrated in one unit. So basically, as long as you only have to do this once, the Killeen construction is feasible. So for example, for isolated singularities, it's feasible to perform. So the Q Note that it's a singular quadrant. Same thing as calculating the cohomology of a 
vector bundle without zero friction. Can be calculated. Yeah. 
zero. So we know what it is everywhere else, and it's zero. It's just. example of a of an intersection topology complex that is not concentrated in degree in a single in a single degree it's not a it's not a sheet. And um, then tomorrow we'll discuss the decomposition theorem. And I want to kind of argue that what this is telling you is that any kind of smooth smooth space that maps to this has to at least have a P1 in the final over this point. So that's what the, essentially what the vehicle is. So, uh, see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. Which is now the middle degree. And so this guy is not, and all the other ones are isomorphic. So this guy is not seen. And this guy is only um, a subspace inside here. So we would like to determine what is the subspace, for example. And this is basically this is Lefschetz's idea that one should consider a whole lot of a whole lot of hyperplane sections at once. This way, in the left of the it is important that the rejected space is very large dimension. No, it should just it should just be a projective variety. So. It, it's enough to have any many. fix an axis, so A, so we fix A inside P, a co-dimension to hyperplane. So this is called the axis. So this corresponds so choosing a co-dimension 2 hyperplane inside here is the same thing as choosing a, a projective line in the dual space. And now what we want to consider is all the hyperplanes that go through this axis. So for example, in, if we're doing it in projective 2 space, and choosing an axis would be choosing a point, and then we'd be choosing all lines that go through that point. And in uh, P, P2, we choose a, choose a line, and then we look at all planes that go through that point. And so, and points on P1 of A correspond to hyperplanes through A. So we have this P1 worth of hyperplanes through A. And these are, this is called a pencil, for reasons that I only kind of 
vaguely understand. So I guess the idea is that you're twisting and it looks like pencil running. So maybe someone can explain. Um, okay, so if x is in x, take away um, x intersect a, intersect the axis, there is a unique hyperplane. through uh, x and a. So as long as our point is not lying a, there's a unique hyperplane. So the basic idea is we have these hyperplanes and then we're going to look at the, the sections. So the intersections of these hyperplanes in our space. So this determines, this gives a map. <coughs> x take away. A if you want to So this is annoying because we've removed this locus. So to make F well defined, everywhere we consider X builder, which is pairs of X. H in X times P1 of A such that X is in H. And now we have a perfectly good map down to P1 of A, which is just remembering this hyperplane. And the fibers are the hyperplane. So now we've arranged all our hyperplane sections into a nice map. And actually this is the so maybe a nice exercise. Is that this X tilde is the blower of X in X. Do you require that the intersection is smooth? Probably. I mean, I will in a second. And probably to do this exercise, I should. map from any variety y to P1 
to the left that's vibrating. <coughs> if it's satisfied. And if we have F from X, so, so we have a map from F, F from X to C, so this is now local. Um, a point X in U is an ordinary double point. If, um, if the differential vanishes at x and a sub coordinates around u, s again, some coordinates. Z1 up to Zn, the Hessian is not the same. Uh, is what you call the X. Uh, X. So let's have a break for seven minutes and afterwards I'll explain the motivation behind these, these notions. Continue. Is there any So now I just want to spend a little bit of time uh, trying to explain the kind of motivation for this. So why why this is a lovely thing? So what is a uh, hyperplane? This is a this was this axis. So it's a codimension two, yeah, which was an affine variety. And Andrea, I thought about. Um, the question for cohomology vanishing. So it's easy to find examples of perverse sheaves that have no cohomology and no compactness of one And so uh, no matter where you shift them, okay. cohomology doesn't see any. So you really have to choose any of them. So is this sense? Sorry? Is this sense? Yeah, fix that out, yeah. <laughs> so uh, if you think about classic so Morse theory, you take F, so M is a manifold, and you take F from M to R sufficiently general. And one thinks about this as being the height. And so now you have your manifold, and this is the absolutely canonical picture, the drawing more theory, where you start off and you imagine how your manifold changes as you move up. And if your M is sufficiently general, then as you move up, there's only very precise changes that can happen, and everything happens in kind of one degree, and it's controlled by something called the Morse index. And so this is an example um, where we're trying to we're trying to understand our manifold via this kind of sufficiently general map to R. And then um, this Lefschetz theory. So I guess we can't lift it to do 
the same thing. Around the bank, right? But now, of course, if we have a projective variety, we expect a map to, to, for example, P1. That would be the best that we could hope for. And so now we have our, our X. And we're mapping to P1. And this, uh, this condition of being an ordinary double point is a genericity condition, which I'll explain in a second. So basically it says that something generic happens at finitely many points on P1. And away from that, it's a vibration. But notice the difference to Morse theory. In Morse theory, we have a very clear minus infinity and infinity. And we have a very clear direction in which we go. And so in some sense, the theory is rather simple. But here, we don't have any clear direction. And the thing that replaces direction is monodromy. You know, you can imagine any, any path around here as being a, a kind of direction. And so in order to analyze all of these things, so the kind of slogan is direction minus infinity and infinity is replaced by But the miraculous thing that happens is that just as in Morse theory, you have these lovely theorems that tell you that something can only happen in a very specific degree. The same thing happens here, which I'll explain in a second. And that's extremely related to the fact that this W, when we're defining Kovacis on curves, is only concentrated in one degree, this vanishing cycle. Ah, so it's the same true in algebraic Sorry? The same true in algebraic it changes here. Yeah, it changed, yeah, as we go across the similarity here, it changes precisely in one degree. Sorry, it changed precisely, I couldn't hear. The, so, um, here we're looking at the cohomology of the level sets, mm -hmm. and the statement is that you know you glue on a cell of a precise dimension that you can tell from the Hessian, that you can tell from the index of the Hessian. And here the statement is that um, now we're over the complexes, so we can't talk about the index of the Hessian, and it turns out that something just happens in one specific degree always. And this is the vanishing cycle. <coughs> okay. Uh, so now I, I want to discuss the local structure theory. So what's the motivation for ordinary motivation for ordinary double point is these are the generic singularities It's, it's important. So I find this hard to imagine that why ordinary double points are the kind of generic singularities, but I find the following picture very useful. Is that um, n equals 1 case. So imagine if you have the map from C to C that is z goes to z cube. So its real graph looks like this. And you, one can really think that this is some algebraic curve and we're projecting to some P1 inside. This is part of our left set vibration. Um, but the point is that if we move our axis slightly, then suddenly it becomes two. So if we perturb, then it becomes something like this. And now these are ordinary double points. Now we have ordinary double So the moral 
from this picture um, is that if, if as part of your, your map associated with this left shift vibration, you have something like this, you can move your axis slightly and you'll produce something that has all the elements. So that's the kind of motivation to this. And now we have the polymorphic Morse lever. which says that if f from u inside cpn um, to c has an ordinary double point, precise description of what happens at these singularities topologically locally around each singular point. So let's do the first cases. So um, n is equal to 1. So this is what happens when we hit double points of curves. So in this case it's like the map z goes to z squared. 
So you have two points that collide. Two fibers. n equals 2, that's the picture of x, y equals 1, x, y equals epsilon, we're generating x, y equals 0. Or another way of seeing it is where you see the 0 section is x squared plus y squared equals epsilon, we're generating so in this picture, you see the circle that, that is contracting the limit. And for n equals 3, there's a lovely manifestation representation theory. And what is it? S n. S n. S n. So we have this map from um, C from S to From S L to C, which in this case is A to W. Well, and then we determine what is 1 or the sum to 3 from the other. So this has a regular a regular class generating the new one. And in fact, um, in this case, this is diffeomorphic to the Springer resolution. So this is diffeomorphic to the Springer resolution, and you can interpret this as being the Springer map. Excuse me, I don't understand the statement of the exercise. For uh, epsilon non zero, f minus one epsilon intersect b zero x. So what is x? I'm confused. Um, this should be the, the double point at x. Yeah, so, so basically I'm saying that we have to back down to c. And it has a problem here. Hmm. And then I'm saying that if you take the inverse of image of epsilon, so this has some problematic behavior. So this is the fiber over zero. And if I take the inverse of image of epsilon, so here's my ball around around x. Oh, did I use epsilon? Oh, zero. No. It's, a, it's very confused. Yeah, it's completely, completely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> x delta. It's better. <laughs> it's so, better. But now, is, is it now for you? It's okay. <laughs> Does it make sense to the statement? So, it's built here. And then I want to say if I take this part of here, so, so this is the smooth part, and I intersect it with this ball, then it has the following description. Yeah, but what disturbs me is that the second example, n equal 2, you get union of two things, so I'm confused. I don't understand. 
x y equal epsilon, right? Yeah, x y equals epsilon. I mean, this. So this is the real picture. Ah, the, uh, I see. I and, see. And this is the you, you can see pretty easily. This is the cotangent bundle of s one. Okay. Okay. Because it's a real picture. Yeah, okay. You have these two. This you, know, you can imagine this the complex circle going around. Okay. So sorry about that. And then, um, in order to, to, in some sense, completely understand what's going on, we need to understand what happens when we go around one of these loops. And this is given by the Picardo formula, which I won't state completely correctly because I can never remember the sign. So now we have the um, Picardo transform. correct me if I no it's correct me. Um, which is that so the monotony UI around the Z I acts by gamma goes to the gamma plus or minus, and this is the sign of the gamma C. So um, it's very nice now to go back to the example of the um, elliptic curve, which we did in the first lecture, and see this formula in that case. In that case, we have this explicitly described this cycle that vanishes in the singular part. And then we probably can check that the, that the monodromy that we calculated is given by such a formula. And the very nice thing about this is it looks something like a, the action of a, a root system. And in fact, um, there's, a, there's a theorem of the lean that tells you that um, if you look at the Zariski closures of these monodromy groups, 
all you can get is a finite ADE bar group or the full symplectic group or the full upper group, which I find remarkable. Can you speak? We could not hear. No worries. I can repeat as much as you Thank want. Thank you. Um, so you can ask. So these generate some monodromy representation on this D minus first cohomology of the general fiber. And now you can look at all the, so this is a um, finite generated group, and you look at its risky closure. And you ask, what is it? And Deline's theorem is that in this setting of Lefschetz pencils, you either get an AD vial group, so it's finite, and these really the vanishing cycles are roots, or you get um, the full orthogonal or full, full symplectic group. Orthogonal course. Yeah, depending. I mean, there's a you know, just depending on the how you think. It's even. We say uh, self-intersection C I is itself is what is plus minus two. So it's the Euler characteristic of S n minus one. So you know it's either zero or two. Uh, uh, yeah, so it's only in the orthogonal case that you can get something like a root system. And the D is still the complex dimension of the yeah, D is the... Uh, so here is, is a fixed or, or goes to nothing? Sorry? So CI is, is a fixed or goes to nothing? Ah, see, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, it's yeah, so this form, this side always confuses me. I feel like it can never go to its negative. For CI, we, we have to get the uh, two. If you put gamma equal to CI, mm -hmm. and then it's odd even, we have to get a plus. Mm -hmm. This is what you prove in the first step. It was uh, the net is what? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, no, no, but that, 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 that's. That's kind of the square of the Picard left shift ah. left shift situation. Because uh, the, the total space was not smooth. But yes. Probably mine. This is like tomorrow I'll discuss the hundred and bilinear relations and they also there's signs there that confuse the hell out of me. Um, okay, so I just want to give a summary of Thank you. 
So this is the first chance for us. Then of the i make m minus h d minus i x make d plus i and x then I score. So I'll discuss this hard left theorem a little bit more in more detail tomorrow. <coughs> but basically, if we think about the cohomology groups H0, H1, Precisely what you would expect if this was an SL2 representation and L was E and your dimension is the partner H acts because of So now summary so far. So we started with our X which we wanted to understand. And what we did is we replaced it by x tilde. And x tilde was a blow up. Placement is innocent. So, so one understands extremely well what blow-ups do to cohomology and one can prove everything by hand. large generality that's a kind of motivic de decomposition of here. So you always have a cohomology of x inside the blast. So for example, this is true integrally. And then once we've done this, we have this very nice map down to P1. So the moral is it's enough to understand Basically, what I'm explaining here is the, re the reduction in, for, in, for example, the means proof of the vague injection. So here we assume we know everything in dimension less than the dimension of the dimension. So everything means, you know, 
for example, hard left shifts, etc., um, or the vacant vectors in all, in all dimensions, small of the dimension of x. And we want to use this left shift vibration to give a round. And now, um, the weak left shift theorem. So remember that the five of the left are the hyperplane sections. So now we want to, so now there's kind of two steps. The first step <coughs> is that the hard left shift theorem so this is a, another thing we call the sheets. So this is a formal thing in triangulated categories. It implies a plot for um, a smooth fiber. which we know by induction, implies that if we take the direct, the direct image of the function should be So if you think about what the um, what the cohomology sheets of this uh, direct image are, at a point they're the they're the cohomology of a hyperplane section. But the weak left shift theorem says that this this cohomology group does not change at all. There's always restriction from from x as an isomorphism, except in this critical degree. So you said at left shift, and you mean the cat left shift? No, I really mean. I left it to get this huh. But for the for the last sentence, it's the Ah, and, and this is weak left shifts. Yeah, weak left shifts. Slash the car left shifts. Restriction from the global cohomology of x to a hyperplane section is an isomorphism, and so this is what trivializes this local system. One can think about this decomposition as being a, a kind of special case of the decomposition theorem. So it remains to understand. So, 
sort of the fear. I'll call you through the particular fears that you can actually fear or I'll call you blood. So I'm saying that if you already know the decomposition theorem, then this is this just follows straight away. Yes. But you can think about it as being a, a particular case of the decomposition theorem that you can prove by hand if you know. I can't believe I'm adopting the Russian by hand. By hand. Without proof. Mm -hmm. um, so you can prove the hard left shape theorem by hand if you. So you can prove this decomposition if you know hard left shapes. This is, this is a simple case of decomposition. And this is given, this is given <coughs> by the by the challenge. And then there's this, um, this lovely observation of left shapes. Which is that, um, so remember we have the d minus first cohomology of x, and this injects into the d minus first cohomology of xh. And this is the stalk at h of this. this so this is a point. So using this one, using this fact, one can show that um, the hard left shift group the X is implied by um, the fact that the maximum trivial So in some sense you have F, you have the invariance, and the pi one of something. And you have the co-invariance. And we want that this happen in that form. It's a crazy situation because in some sense one knows the monodromy of this local system extremely explicitly by the pick out left shift theorem. However, um, so let's get to play. So it's, it's not at all obvious that it's semi simple.
<laughs> so I, I find this a kind of remarkable situation that you have this local system that's given in some sense quite explicitly by quite you know, explicit formulas, but it's extremely difficult to see whether it's semi simple or not. And we saw the first example of this, it's not exactly the situation, but it's very related, in this example of the Weierstrass family of elliptic curves. That it was kind of semi simple, but for some non trivial reason. Is it the same statement that we said before the evolutionary exposure? That's in some cases somewhat similar to that statement of the exposure? I mean, yes. If you know, if you know that statement, then you know some is implicit. So it's yes. equivalent to the simplicity of the action of the monotony. Yeah. Well, no, not here. Uh, so what you need for hard left sets is that the maximum trivial subobject is the that the map from the invariance to the co-invariance is a nice small position. That's enough to get hard left sets. So is this a it's a good question. I, I feel like it I'm trying to work out if he knows that before or Yeah, I have to think about that. That's a good question. What was the good question? Like <laughs> whether the semi-simplicity is implied by the statement that I made about the monotony groups. At what point he knows that in the idea. Um, so this was kind of intended as a um, <coughs> as a discussion of the decomposition in a special case and also an example of this very powerful tool of left shift pencils. And then tomorrow I want to uh, explain the Descartes-Alemini or any proof of the decomposition theorem in the case of a semi-small map. And then that was all. So, so it's, a it's a special class of maps that, it's, it's precisely the class of maps for which the direct image is perverse. And this is, the, this is the starting point of their induction. And in the proof, one sees kind of essentially everything that we've seen so far. So lots of properties of reverse shoes, weak left shifts, hard left shifts, plus some um, quadrivalent by the reaction stuff. So I'm in, I'm pro. So thanks. Semi-simple means that action of the monotony group, group is completely removed. Exactly. But you know, it's a, it's a purely topological statement. Mm -hmm. um, and also, in a given example, you can